Our guest speaker needs no introduction, however, that would put me out of work. Um, so it um, gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Lance O'Sullivan, who is an accomplished author, speaker, role model, and disruptive leader and innovator. From a young boy labelled by society as a troublemaker, Lance developed a passion, a passionate um, developed into a passionate advocate for Māori health. He is a pioneer for equal health care in his community and a champion for creating a fairer New Zealand. Harnessing the skills acquired from his cultural heritage and medical training, Lance and his wife Tracy established Navaloso Medical, a health care company committed to developing innovative ways to ensure appropriate and quality health care reach the right people in the right place at the right time. In 2014, Lance was made the Kiwi Bank New Zealander of the Year. In 2013, he was awarded the Māori of the Year. In that same year, the Public Health Association Health Champion Award. Inspired by the opportunities that he himself had experienced in life and which allowed him to grow and develop into a well-educated, well-rounded family man and community leader, Lance founded the Moko Foundation. Today, Lance is here to share his work with iMoko. iMoko is an innovative approach utilising technology to deliver high quality, basic health services with a focus on communities with high needs, particularly vulnerable children. The centrepiece of iMoko is smart software that has been developed specifically for community-based virtual health services managed by the communities themselves. iMoko serves to uphold the mission to democratise healthcare by putting everyday technology in everyday people's hands where they live, work and play, achieving improved outcomes by the people for the people. Please join me in welcoming Dr Lance O'Sullivan. O kia ora tātou katoa, uh, tēnei wā te tuatahi, uh, i te tuatahi te kananga mihi ki te, te kaihanga o tātou e i runga roa, ko io te timatanga, ko iono te whakatūtu ki tanga o ngā mea katoa, nō no rere hono re kororo ia kia ia. Uh, tuarua huriana ngā mihi ki a rātou ngā tini mate ki rongi a koutou, ki rongi a mātou, ngā mate puta nō te motu, uh, haere e ngā mate haere, haere hoki atu. I tēnei wā huriana ngā mihi ki a tātou, koutou ngā kanohi tawhito, Renau, uh, me tahi atu o ngā, uh, ngā hoa mai o mua, uh, ki a, a koutou no hoki uh, ngā kanohi hau me ki, nō reira tēnei te mihatu ki a koutou, ko a tai mai mo tēnei kaupapo te rā, ara ko te haura, ko te oranga pai o, o ngā tāngata katoa puta noa te motu. Nō reira tēnā koutou, talofa lava, malau le lei, whakalofa lahi atu, uh, kia ora ana, nese bulavanaka, and hello. <laughs> Ni hao. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. The, um, kia ora, thanks for the introduction. I think I could probably sit down now. <laughs> yeah, uh, look, you know, I'm going to just talk a little bit about the, uh, some of the, uh, the, 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 the comments made there. It was, uh, you know, the New Zealand of the year. One New Zealander in New Zealand doesn't think it's, uh, thinks it's overrated, right? He, he thinks I, I play in it too much. There's a man who's in his, his late 70s, and uh, a couple of weeks ago I had lunch with him at his home in somewhere up in the hills of Wellington. I was invited to have uh, lunch with him and his family, and it was lovely. It was uh, on the back of, a, um, of an article he wrote in a, a fairly prominent uh, business journal around uh, how um, the indigenous people of New Zealand, my people, uh, should behave in terms of a sense of gratitude. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and I was, like many, I was quite upset about hearing about this. It's just someone would say such a horrible thing as, you know, you, you could be my servant and do my lawns and, and come and bring me breakfast in bed. So I reached out to this person and uh, the funniest of connections joined us together. And I, uh, and I said, look, I'd love to talk to you about a few things. Um, one is, uh, he's, this person is a boxing, boxing aficionado. And I've have, have a charity fight in uh, in about three weeks in, in Kaitaia, and uh, so I said I, I need some advice. And I uh, also, you know, he's a businessman and a polit politician, has a history of polit politics. Uh, and so those two things sort of uh, become recent um, interests of mine. And uh, so I spent I spent uh, four hours with this person talking about how 
uh, how the influence and power of his position uh, has the opportunity to either bring people together or take people apart and divide our country. And I asked the, what the legacy was that this person was hoping to leave. And anyway, uh, at, the, uh, at the end of the day, you know, through the whole day or the afternoon, I was, I was pushing for the, uh, the, uh, the uh, concession that he'd got it wrong. And I didn't get it. <laughs> but uh, it's just I was about to get off his, uh, his private jet, actually. Um, uh, I, uh, I said, look, you could do one thing that's really good for me. You're in the twilight of your career, and I'm in the highlight of my career. What you could do, which is very small uh, on your part, could be very big on my part. And you could offer a retraction of what you said. And you could say that you spent afternoon with uh, a person who uh, shifted your opinions on things and, uh, and made you move your position. And, uh, and if you like, I could draft up a media release and send it to you. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't expect any less. And uh, the funny thing is, I did send that draft media release through, and um, I wrote it the for the for um, the forward was, you know, my wife has asked what's the chances of this happening, and I said, look, I think it's uh, better than a snowball's chance in hell and less than 10%. But I said, uh, well, you and I share one thing in common, we hate to do what everyone else thinks we're going to do. Anyway, the long and short of it is um, uh, that, uh, unfortunately, that uh, wasn't achieved, but hey, you never know. But I guess why I mentioned that is because he said, oh, you've let this New Zealand of the Year thing go to your head, Lance. <laughs> And he said, it's overrated. So I said, oh, yeah, fair enough. But at um, the end of the day, uh, look, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. The idea of um, health and technology, what is it? Where it changes here. It's so exciting to be in, an order, uh, in a forum like this because, you know, change is here. <clears throat> change is required uh, because, you know, we don't do a good enough job. And tinkering around the edges of a of a system that's you know, not working and hasn't been working for a long time won't result in change, just will result in a different you know, um, shape and, and uh, appearance of the same old thing. So, you know, and I'm really excited about the change that's afoot for our, our, our health system, uh, for my people, uh, for our communities and for our, our country. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm here as a you know, a disruptor, uh, a troublemaker, yep. I'll tell you about, real quickly, my backstory is this. My father's one of 18, my mother's one of five, Māori, Pākehā, Catholic middle-class farming family, Māori, highly deprived, significant economic and cultural dislocation, lots of violence, crime, alcohol abuse, everything else. And, you know, something quite different on this side. I was three when my mother took me to visit my father and, and Mount Eden Prison for the first time. Did anyone know that? Okay, so um, I think Paula and some others have been bored with my speech before. Well, um, is it? And uh, look after each other, eh? Yeah, kia ora, kia ora. Uh, and so, and I was about four and a half when my mother came home from working late in the evening, at a, in the early hours of the morning, uh, to find her six-year-old daughter walking around the lounge, pouring beer into the jugs of the uncles who'd come home from the pub with my father. And at that point in time, her best friend said, you can't stay here anymore, we're gonna take you out of this environment and you're gonna go and live with me, you're gonna come and live with me. And so we did, and we lived. It was, uh, and as I, as I reflected on it recently, I spoke at DePaul, uh, DePaul House, which is a uh, emergency housing Catholic organization in the, on the North Shore of Auckland. That was our emergency housing experience. You know, we're uplifted in an informal way by someone who cared about us and my mother and her children and placed somewhere that would allow us to be safe and then give us a chance to, to get going in life. And so, yeah, I, mean, it's, I, I share that and sort of some of my other journey, uh, you can get it's in a book called The Good Doctor, $39.95 <laughs> at Wickles. There might be signed copies outside. <laughs> No, nah. um, uh, you know, I share that really brief part of my story because 
you should understand why I'm so passionate about social justice. And they're so passionate about supporting our most vulnerable at a time when they, are, they need it the most from our country because our investment as a country and our most vulnerable uh, could pay dividends to our country you know, and provide you know, something quite exceptional in terms of um, you know, what we might discover in, this, um, in, these, uh, in these homes and corners of, of society and country. So that's sort of my background okay, about what I, um, what, I, uh, sort of what I bring to this. You know, I went to medical school to have impact and I, the, the skills and tools I required and acquired at that time were of a, of a medical sort of basis in terms of, you know, I, have, I had the skills to, and have the skills to, to have impact through being a doctor and working in communities such as Kai Tai. Um, what's really exciting, I spoke to a 17-year-old boy the other day, and a 17-year-old girl yesterday, from Okaiho in Northland about um, the fact that, you know, during the course of your life, your professional, your, the tools might change. So you might pivot into different areas in your, your life. It's really important we teach young people that. Because if you say you're going to be this forever, it locks them in and it doesn't give them the opportunity to explore. And, and also, it's um, what I was saying to this young person is the why for me hasn't changed. It's just the how. And this young person yesterday, this young lady, a girl, uh, Willow, uh, from Okaiho, she heard that. The why hasn't changed. My why is I went to medical school to have impact. I want to I contribute to better health outcomes for Māori. Um, and more recently, it's about more uh, sustainable um, services and models of care for a health system that will drown under our current sort of way of practising and uh, in terms of cost. Um, but the how changes, and so like, you know, I've stopped using a stethoscope and prescription pad, and I use, um, you know, different tools. And uh, I've stopped working as a clinician as such and picked up this role of a digital health entrepreneur or disruptor or, you know, whatever you'd like to call it. Just different tools, different role, but the same why. Okay, so it's really important for me that we inspire young people to have a really strong why, and we, we inspire them to be agile enough to think about how we change the how. And so this is really exciting that this young girl just got it. And I think education, I'm sort of here to talk about health and technology, I know I'll get there, but um, uh, the education uh, system needs to respond to how we train young people in the same way. So the idea of you know, having a curriculum that's, you know, you know, the way of teaching that's decades old, centuries old, needs to, needs to be revisited. So uh, I, it's always good to know uh, who's heard me talk about digital health and the technologies that um, I'm sort of passionate about. Has anyone heard that? Oh, excellent. There's only a few. Renal, you put your hand up slightly because you were here on Thursday with me and we're, we sort of don't, we've agreed we both don't have a life living here in Wellington when we should be at our home. But um, so the idea of, you know, the idea of health is that it's very clinician centric, nurse, doctor centric, hospital based, clinic based. So the idea is, you know, you get sick, you go to the doctors. And I think this is, a, this is an opportunity to use, that's meant to represent sort of the technologies that are sit above us, cloud, mobility, a whole lot of other stuff that allows us to re reshape what we, we are talking about when we talk about health. And uh, so this is a really cool project I'm work working on. And this is Dr. Ai Ropata, and she's not from Ngāti Kahungungu. <laughs> as pretty as she is, Paula, she's from Te Rarawa. And um, <clears throat> it's only a still image, and I've, I've, I mean, in about three weeks, <clears throat> we're gonna have a, a live version, uh, a sort of a proof of concept of a digital doctor that is going to respond to me on stage and asking me questions about my health um, with some, a you know, the premises behind this avatar is some AI, something like IBM Watson, which is an artificial intelligence learning platform, deep learning platform that allows a machine to look at, to draw on knowledge around a particular topic that could be three or four hours old from global sort of sources and to use um, 
the, this interface to communicate with a patient and to capture all the information you need to take a really thorough history and to start thinking about what um, is the next step in terms of the treatment and management for a patient. So this is Digital Doctor that I, I'm, the plan is that, because uh, I'm working with a company called Soul Machines. Soul Machines is like probably one of the most exciting digital companies in New Zealand that I, I know of. And, uh, and the co-founder, one of the co-founders is Ngapui, so I'm no surprise there. And, uh, and so we hope to sort of uh, launch this proof of concept in, uh, at the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care uh, Society conference in the Viaduct on the 4th of April. Uh, it's a paediatric um, sub-conference, I think. And uh, yeah, so the idea that you used to go to a doctor when you're sick, that's got a life uh, expectancy of uh, probably less than five years to be the only way you can access medical care. And uh, I look forward to the day where we uh, hold the first virtual consultation uh, with a digital doctor. And um, why are digital doctors awesome? Digital avatars and stuff, humans? A few things. One is they have this amazing capacity to process information in a way that a human can't. Two is they could, you could have a thousand or a million consultations happening at once. Uh, three is you could customise this person to look like any of you in the room. Also, if you have populations of people that look different. Uh, and I guess the other thing is, what's the most important thing is, they won't judge you. And I think, and I believe, this is probably going to be the most, um, the biggest circuit breaker, right? So you imagine a 17-year-old who wants to share with someone about their sexual health or their mental health, knowing that not going to, there's not going to be any judging going on. People will freak out about this because they'll say, Oh, where's the human um, element in this? Well, look, the research shows that digital avatars are incredibly acceptable to people, for not just health, in any space, uh, if they have high quality uh, avatars that look very, you know, very, very uh, realistic likeness to a person. Um, the person that I'm hoping to be our, our first digital doctor is currently um, um, Tedarawa Girl who plays a doctor on Shorten Street. It's awesome. And uh, so, you know, I've, that's sort of the future. You won't go to a doctor. It's bringing the doctor to you. Currently, um, uh, this, I mean, this sort of technology has been used in um, uh, help desks in the United States. These guys developed this for a help desk uh, in a large company in the United States. So you talk to a person, a digital human, rather than a person on the phone. So this is what... I'm up to. Every year, over 200,000 kids don't get to see a doctor when they really need one. That's about the population of Hamilton. Maybe they can't see one in time. Maybe the doctor is too far away or their family just can't afford the cost. Almost 50,000 kids couldn't get a prescription filled because it just costs too much. That's thousands of our precious children who miss out on education, miss out on family time, and just miss out because they aren't well. And the unlucky ones get worse and end up in our hospitals. This needs to change. The problem will only get worse. Almost half of our GPs will retire in the next 10 years, so it's going to be harder to find a doctor available when you're ill. Some big chunks of rural New Zealand are already struggling with places like Taranaki only having around 56 GPs for every 100,000 people. Our health spending is being outstripped by need and the system is so stretched that people can wait for between three and a half days and three and a half weeks to get help. Our most vulnerable people waiting that long to see a doctor. This can't continue. What if there was a different way to think about health? where time, distance and cost weren't such big factors, where doctors work smarter, not harder, where kids only have to wait three and a half minutes for healthcare, where the technology that's already changed the way we travel, shop and play makes a real difference to our health. The future is virtual healthcare. More health to more people for less cost. Right, um, 
does anyone sort of have any major objections about that sort of aspiration? That uh, some of the technologies that we actually are quite, you know, um, you know, all over this room and uh, that you utilise all the time would feature in something as important as uh, core health service. You know, the, the answer is, in my opinion, is that, you know, it will happen. And what's exciting about this for me is that when it happens, it'll be driven by the people. It'll be, you know, like, if you are a, if you're a disruptive player in, uh, in this space, like just, if you're in a different sector, you're not going you know, Uber's not gonna go to Blue Bubble Cabs and tell them about how wonderful uh, ride sharing using digital platforms are gonna be for their business. And actually you wouldn't even think to partner with them. Netflix is not gonna partner with Sky. You know, uh, funny enough, Netflix was born uh, out very, like, 19, mid 90s, and uh, they went to the, the, the reason for being was something called Blockbuster Video, right? It was a multi billion dollar American industry, uh, offices and shops all around the, the globe. And they, they, uh, they, they created Netflix because the, the, the pain point that everyone had was they didn't like paying for overdue fees. I hated taking your video back and having to pay $7 or, you know, for us locally, $7 uh, for a movie that your kids took out and that you had to pay, you know, and I just have it all the time. Um, they also didn't like, you know, the pain point was people wanted to go and get a video and it was out. Or, um, you know, their selection was limited and they couldn't watch the, the, the latest things. And so that's why Netflix came about. And Netflix actually uh, offered to sell to Blockbuster and they said, no, no, you guys are just, you're just a uh, phase and you'll disappear. So I think five years later, Blockbuster disappeared. So, so, you know, it's really interesting where we are at. And some of your traditional players in this space uh, will be really disrupted. Okay, and I, I'll, you know, it's really exciting because it will be driven by what people want. If you think about, like I have a couple of, about a year ago, I was actually having, I was going to the rugby with Steve McKernan, and I was sitting, I had to catch a cab, and I was sitting on the side of the, the, the road, and I thought, no, I'm not gonna go with an Uber, because it was like, I don't know if you know much about Uber, it's like 2.5 surge, it's too expensive. I'll just get an old blue bubble cab to Eden Park. After an hour and 15 minutes of waiting, not knowing where the hell this cab was, and after making three phone calls to the blue bubble, uh, people who are uh, helpline who, you know, I got put onto a shift manager who found out, sound, said I sounded upset <laughs> and, um, and oh, I'll just cancel the cab then that I've got around the corner for you at hour 15. I was like, how the hell are you guys going to compete in this new age where I can get a cab in three minutes, not have to pay when I get out, know where it is and know that I'm not going to get ripped off in, in terms of my travel. Funny thing is, think about this in terms of health. <clears throat> 15 years ago, I would have sat on the side of the road for an hour and 15 minutes and not known any better. Okay. Um, today, I know better, and so I'm never going to go back. Now, that is going to be where health consumers are going to be in five years, if not a decade. They will not understand why the hell you would make an appointment that was for 15 minutes and you only got 11 and a half. You waited 45 minutes in a really useless waiting room, which really wasn't inspiring. I'm talking about my waiting room. Um, and 45 minutes is probably a good day. <laughs> the, um, and you might see someone who was, he didn't even know you. And if they, they should know you because they got their full medical record in front of you, but they didn't even refer to it. And uh, it's a person who's uh, clinical, but evidence-based medicine is five years old. And um, someone who, you know, he practices in a really unusual way where they just look at the person in front of them and doesn't think about every, the environment around them and the data, the rich data that comes from around that environment, around that individual, which is how these companies operate, right? So, yeah, so I, I guess this is the change, changes here, and this idea, I really look forward to this day. When, um, when we go, you know, we have, we have a generation ahead of us who go, crazy, crazy system you had. So putting down a stethoscope, so for me, putting down stethoscopes, huge passion. The why is in inequity and inequality of health outcomes in New Zealand. Uh, have a real focus on children. Um, talk about digital health democracy, and you know, that was how it was introduced. Has everyone heard about that idea of uh, democratising health? 
it's not new, is it? I mean, it's really it's happening around the world. Interestingly, the, um, who are the people talking about democratising health? No, it's not doctors and nurses. It's tech companies. It's, you know, imminently there'll be Amazon Health. Okay, so there's Amazon Prime, there's Amazon everything. And um, to my great dismay, I hear they're going to be taking on the All Blacks um, sort of matches, which, oh, it's not dismay, I guess it's still cheaper than Sky, and I can get it anywhere in the world. But um, the, uh, yeah, so democratising health is a, is a term that these big innovative digital health companies are thinking up, and it's not, yeah, you're right, it's not doctors and, and clinics and hospitals and stuff because they stand a lot to lose from democratised healthcare, right? Um, whereas, whereas if you thought about it sensibly, you'd say actually there's huge efficiencies to be gained and possibly, or these tech companies see profits. Um, so a digital health democracy is really, really exciting for me. Um, and so we, we developed this program called iMoco about five years ago. It's really simple technology. So it's uh, you know an application at the front end, some you know mobility devices, you know mobile devices, um, cloud, and the you know it's a cloud-based system. Um, really simple, you know it's like number eight wire and duct tape, and you know just to get it out there and to test the idea that does this have merit and value to communities that have unmet health need, you know for children. So simple technology applied in a smart way. It's quite has quite a interesting uh, uh, results, right? I mean, like if you look at Uber, it's, the technology is really simple. It's it's a payment service, it's mapping service, scheduling certain technologies, and uh, other sort of small parts all brought together, but not really anything spectacular. Some of the more recent stuff is something like they can tell how fast you're going around a corner and they can tell you that if you go that fast around a corner on average, your rider's gonna have this level of discomfort and you should reduce your speed going around corners. And you know, things like that. Um, so, I'll just have a, tell you what iMorkle's about, just show you. Too many kids don't get to see the doctor. Maybe doctors are too expensive, too far away, or just don't understand. That's where iMorkle comes in. It's an app that brings the doctor to the people rather than dragging the people to the doctor. How does it work? Simple. Schools, early childhood centres, kōhanga reo or virtual health pop-up clinics signed up with us have staff trained in how to capture important health information. When a sick person comes along, these staff capture the necessary information and enter it into the iMorkle app. If they need to, they can take photos or videos to help doctors with the eventual diagnosis. This data heads up into the cloud, where it's assessed by our iMorkle team who come up with a treatment plan. The plan is approved by a doctor. They can be nearby or hard at work miles away. This approved plan goes to the parents of the patient. They've got their own version of iMorkle on their device. It shows them what's happened so far and what the plan is to get the patient up and going again. If required, a prescription is included and it can be sent to the patient's nominated chemist ready to pick up when they are. Throughout the process, only the people who need the information get access. Your GP is one of these people who will know what we've done. Your health details stay safe with iMorkle. Fast, safe and efficient. That's healthcare without the hassle. So... I'm going to, I'll give you an example of how this works. Okay, so this is a so this is a this is where I see the future of where healthcare could be delivered. Okay, so in the community by the people. So enabling communities to look after themselves with some digital technologies supported by clinical um, services, right? Uh, so this is this is a, a health service. Um, focus on children, but if I wanted to have a similar service for adult medicine, I'd be thinking that could be a barber shop, and that could be a barber, and a cardiovascular risk assessment for a 40 year old Maori man is gonna take place using some digital clinical tools while he's having a haircut. Okay, that is the future, and I'm really happy to share that, because you know we need to have an emergence of a whole lot of 
digital health enterprises that are driven by entrepreneurs like a lady called Samantha Bailey in, uh, in Christchurch, she's a young doctor I spoke to last night, uh, and um, she created a company called SwiftMed. So SwiftMed's an online doctor service, and I registered for an appointment with her quarter past seven about three weeks ago. Uh, they offer uh, uh, treatment uh, for simple health problems, but it's all virtual. And she decided to create this business because she worked as a GP in, the, in an after hours medical and, and had a patient once that come in and they'd waited two hours for a repeat on their hay fever medication. So it's just really important that they had it. You know, if you've ever had hay fever and you can't get treatment, uh, it can be quite debilitating. And when she, she got to this person, you know, busy doctor, and is that all you're here for? And you wait two hours for that. She's like, it's crazy, and you pay $90 to see me. So she saw the opportunity to then create a, a job, an enterprise for herself to meet that need and be a solution to that problem using some just basic technology platforms. Interesting, she's just got a lot of off-the-shelf stuff, Zoomy and you know, PayPal and all these things that are readily available. So she, you can create a business really quickly. And uh, I actually booked an appointment with her. It's $39.50. Uh, it's really easy. And uh, she offers it for a whole lot of medications, asthma, hay fever, you know, and erectile dysfunction. I was like, um, yeah, I just uh, <laughs> booked this appointment. It's nothing like that. Uh, I just want to talk to you about your business. And uh, it's interesting, though, because uh, she's already felt the, the brunt and borne the brunt of the establishment coming out, right? So... Is anyone from the New Zealand Medical Association here? <laughs> Don't put your hand up. Yeah, because, you know, the president, you know, lovely lady, no doubt, you know, made a comment in the press um, in the relation to this lady's announcement that she's a digital health business, saying, oh, it has no place, and, you know, standalone virtual health services have no place, it's unsafe, and uh, risky, I think the words were used. And, um, yeah, and it was really disappointing because this is a young person who's not trying to be develop an unsafe health practice. And I might just stop and ask you all how safe your current system is. Okay, so um, you know, the, if, even if, if there is risk in new models of care, you know, how does it compare to your current model of care? And I'd say you, we can't stand up and say we've got a completely health, safe health system. So. You know, it's really concerning for me that we have um, a vested interests that will discourage new models of care uh, that, yes, might actually put a lot of people, uh, shift jobs and maybe shift funding. But I said to a room of doc training doctors recently who were quite frightened by the idea that, you know, uh, virtual and digital and, and uh, emerging technologies are going to really redefine their career and their lifetime, you know, that so much so that uh, they may have... Uh, they may have a significant number of, um, the numbers of doctors in New Zealand might drop, and nurses, you know. And their, their question is, oh, what about my job? And I sort of said, well, look, uh, you know, it'd be really interesting, would, who of you would give up your job or realise that your job might be, re, um, you might be repurposed in, in terms of a clinician to something else if it meant that better outcomes could be achieved for the country at, with greater cost savings? And... Uh, yeah, how many of well, the question is that's, you know, yeah, it was interesting because there was some of the people that would, were more worried about their, you know, sustaining jobs versus, you know, the greater good. So anyway, look, uh, so I've gone off a little bit. The, the idea that a, a, a barber could do a health assessment and you're completely shifting where cardiovascular risk assessments take place, it's awesome. And it's using technology. The barber doesn't have to be trained to take a blood pressure. And just put some machine on someone, use an app while they're sitting there, and see some, get some data from their health record. And before that person leaves, they've got a swish haircut and a cardiovascular risk assessment. <laughs> I mean, like, there's a, there's a, there's a thing where we're, 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 we're going to do something in Kaitairi soon. It's a handheld um, echo probe, right? Plugs into a phone. And we're doing it with the Heart Group out of Auckland University uh, to see whether a layperson can get a, an accurate echo of someone's heart, because you add that to a cardiovascular risk assessment, because the whole Framingham studies things is okay, but it's really crude, but you get sort of a structural uh, image of the heart, yeah, you know, it can be really, really helpful and then more precise in terms of your risk messages, right? Okay, so 
The idea here is uh, take health out of the clinics, put it into the hands of people like this lady. So this lady is a centre manager at an early childhood centre. <clears throat> and so why are people like this, who's Beryl Henare, why is she good for, why should we um, enable her to be a health worker? Well, because she knows this child far better than a visiting paediatric nurse, visiting public health nurse, uh, uh, than a doctor who's sitting in a clinic and sees a child for two and a half minutes or three minutes. Uh, and so because the parents and the caregivers know these children really well, okay? They know when they're good and they know when they're not. So enabling her to be able to uh, be a part of the health workforce, an emerging health workforce, would be really good. And so we, we could train her how to use an app in 40 minutes and how to use some of the clinical tools, right? So this, is, this lady has a role which I call a digital health deputy. Have you heard that term before? You haven't heard of digital health deputy before? Okay, because I made it up. <laughs> I made it up and uh, it didn't exist five years ago. Now, so she can do an assessment on a child, and this is particular child's James, four-year-old Māori, three-year-old Māori boy, four-year-old, who's come in with a sore on his left foot. It's two o'clock in the afternoon when he gets assessed. And um, she's made a little bit of a note there, it's swelling around the ankle, heel, Looks like it's coming from a bit of a sore, and if you, if you blew up that sort of image on the left, bottom left there, you'd see he's got an overlying skin infection. She takes a temperature using a digital thermometer, and then she repeats it 15 minutes later. Like, this is a, an ECE worker who's operating like a triage, ED triage nurse, all right? All right, so cool. We didn't train to do that. Why that's exciting is if you, it demonstrates that if you give people, if you enable people to do something, they will blow your minds in terms of what they're capable of doing. And uh, so that's really exciting. So she does all this information, she collects all this information. This is a child that if I was using something like AI, artificial intelligence, which is really just really super smart electronic decision support software, um, I would say a four-year-old boy living in this part of the country who's male, who has presenting with a painful, um, problem of his ankle uh, with a low grade temperature uh, is going up in my level of concern um, because of the demographics around under five year old Māori children being admitted into hospital for ambulatory sensitive hospitalisation, skin infections, any type of infectious disease. So then she can do a video of this child through the app. So, so she could do that in about, she could do that assessment in about four and a half minutes, okay, from her, her, her kindergarten, and because she knows he wasn't behaving his normal self in his normal way. Uh, what's exciting about that, and I'll, I'll share with you soon actually, so what, so what she can do now is that can go from the centre to a call centre, digital health call centre, staffed by digital health workers, have you heard that term before? I, I, yeah, that made that up too. So, and that's in Kaitai. So these are a lot, a lot of young ladies. Some of them have been in Kaitai College. They don't have any particular qualification or degree in working in telemedicine, okay? So no doctors or nurses in that picture. And they're looking at patterns of disease, okay? They're looking at uh, a swollen ankle, which is painful, with a low-grade temperature, with an overlying skin infection, and they're saying that the pattern recognition there is representative of our skin infection, which has got worse, and the child's got a problem now. Then they can link it to a, a clinical protocol for a child of that age, of that weight, of that allergy um, back status, um, to a management plan. So pattern recognition linking to a management protocol is, is artificial intelligence. And so what people in the tech space are saying, oh, you're just using people to do artificial intelligence, Lance. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's quite fun at the moment. So, okay, so those two people, this one on the left and this one in the middle, those two groups of people, the digital health aides, deputies, and the, and the workers, uh, soon will be going through a NZQA qualification, micro-credential qualification by a tertiary organisation here in New Zealand that we've, like, I think we're, I'm going to the Dunedin next week to look at the curriculum and sign off on the content because we're training a whole new workforce. So there's going to, technology's going to create, uh, take jobs, but it's going to create jobs. 
Okay, <clears throat> and then we have to ensure we have some comp competencies and standards around who's doing the assessment at this site and who's managing the cases in this site. At the end of the day, in New Zealand, currently, it has to go to a doctor to approve, uh, or a prescriber, should I say. And so, imagine the timeline along the bottom is eight minutes, okay? Eight minutes. And it went from, just say, uh, Cannons Creek Kindergarten to a digital health call centre in Kaitaia to a doctor at a game in rugby of, in Chicago, Toyota Park, watching the Māori All Blacks play the US Eagles. That, that's what happens, okay? Eight minutes. And then after that, <clears throat> the child gets the right treatment. They get to go where they should go, which is all of this pointed to a, a, a cellulitis uh, and a joint, or overlying a joint, and a high-risk four-year-old child who, who uh, needed this sort of treatment and investigation, so they needed x-rays and blood tests and a whole lot of other things. And so the child was in hospital for four days. They had an MRSA infection of their skin and they were treated appropriately and they went after four days. It costs you know, anywhere between two and four thousand dollars a day for admission in the hospital. Uh, uh, and, uh, but it's also not just the financial costs, it's the fact that this nana had to go and look after this child because the, other, the mother had to stay at home with the other children who, because the father was trying to make sure he didn't get, lose his job. And so, you know, the burden of these preventable problems, or at least um, problems that we should manage far better, falls heavily on our very uh, co communities and populations, very sensitive to added burden, right? Now, I, uh, the big concern here is that this child, so this is two o'clock in the afternoon that this lady did a health assessment on this child using some technology, really simple technology, but at about two o'clock, 12 o'clock, so a couple of hours before, the mother of this child, her name's Paula, had taken this child to a doctor, to a clinic, and uh, said, look, this is the problem. And they had seen them and said, look, it's just a sprained ankle and here's some anti-inflammatories, uh, see how things go. She actually brought the child back to kindergarten to get an assessment for a virtual service, who served her better than your bricks and mortar analog health service. And uh, funny that, because I spoke to the clinicians involved, said, oh, what happened there? Because, uh, you know, we think, we saw this, we didn't see this child, we just saw it virtually and clearly had a cellulitis that needed admission and four days of antibiotics. Oh, look, you know, they said, no, we never heard that this child couldn't walk. We didn't hear about pain and his temperature, child had temperature, the check of temperature. I mean, the likelihood of a four-year-old having a sprain of the medial ankle, which is very, very hard because anatomically, you've got really strong medial ligaments in your ankle, so it's really hard to sprain your ankle. Even a four-year-old's almost impossible. Uh, and overlying skin infection. It's like, man, this is like a real big problem. But I've stopped being really critical, although maybe not so publicly, <laughs> of, um, of health system and started saying, how can I make parts of it irrelevant? How can I, how can I stop asking clinicians and, and organisations to be responsive to the needs of sort of my people and starting to say, okay, change is on the horizon, health changes here, health and technology, it's gonna be technology driven change that will perhaps make you less relevant and less important in the, in the area of health service delivery. And that's, you know, colleagues of mine for decades have been talking about re more responsiveness to my people. And I just said, oh, waste of breath. Let's, ta let's ta start a different approach. So, um, look, I won't go, I think, uh, I think it'd be good to have uh, you know, some questions. We'll just see if there's anything else to talk about. Not really. Uh, yeah, I, I think. Oh, I'll quickly talk about this. So, really, I, I talk about simple technology using in a smart way. Some of the emerging technologies, which I will say, I'll, I'll call what they are, but I won't even understand <laughs> seriously what they're all about. But like blockchain around, you know, how's blockchain technology going to? Um, really change the way people own data, health data. So this one patient, one parent might have a child with 10 data sets on them. They know nothing about probably nine and a half of them. Um, how do you use 
uh, technologies like blockchain to give them power and ownership over their own data and therefore more meaningful um, understanding of it. So that's some of the emerging technologies, AI, new interfaces like um, digital avatars, um, the Internet of Things. So, uh, you know, like your Fitbit's a really good example of that. But there are so many other emerging technologies, wearable nanotechnologies that could allow us to do far more. And then, you know, like I say, a doctor will see a patient just as the patient, not the all of the rich data that comes from around them. And, and that's going to be changed a lot when you start getting information from sensors and everything. Um, I've got some really exciting tools we're using in our proof of concept for the digital avatar. And one is a digital stethoscope that you can plug it into a device like that. It doesn't look like that. The, forget the earpiece thing, it's a waste of time now because uh, the, the device plugs into your phone and you can record digital audio sounds of your heart and lungs and that can go to the cloud and then cloud AI can figure out. In the context of four-year-old Samoan child from Otara who's been having fevers and cough and vomiting for eight days, and what does this, these clinical, these digital audio sounds in his left, base of his left chest um, mean? And I'm describing a kid who, who last week sat for two hours in a clinic in South Auckland, didn't get seen, the mother took them home and then rung the, the kindergarten we are in in South Auckland and asked them to log a case. And we got them, they got the treatment they needed, right? But uh, it's, it's a real concern how many holes we have that, are, that people are slipping through. But these sort of technologies are currently plug in to your device thing, and we've got all these things we're playing with. But soon you're gonna have a super device that have everything. Enhanced microphones allowing you to have a digital stethoscope. Enhanced cameras allow you to have a dermoscope type function. All these other things, like ECGs from your phone. So it's gonna be really interesting. Okay, and I think, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have much more to say. I just think, you know, it's important, it's really exciting to be here around, you know, change, change is here, technology driven. It's not gonna be, a new cure for cancer. You know, it's not, it's not gonna be a cure for cancer, the latest heart drug that has the potential to shift the outcomes in such a positive way. It's gonna be connecting more people to healthcare with our current knowledge and our current treatments, and that's access. And it's not gonna be by creating another 100 clinics and hospitals, and it's not gonna be about graduating thousands more health professionals. It's about saying, we just got to do things differently and embrace some of the technologies that are in people's lives. So, uh, yeah, and we can then provide more care to more people for less cost. Imagine a Minister of Health is saying we need, uh, over the next decade, we need 200, let's just say 200 less doctors graduating, 400 less doctors over the next 10 years, and the savings from that are going to be applied to the Minister of Housing, or the Minister of Education. Now, that's exciting, because that's a huge cost, and if we save that, we're not just saving money there, we're actually must be creating a whole new workforce and, and a capacity within communities to look after themselves. So that's what we should aspire to. So kia ora everyone, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Sorry for those that have heard me speak before. It's always boring to hear the same thing twice, but kia ora tato. Paula doesn't need a microphone. Yeah, so my thoughts are, so mental health and uh, digital platforms, right? So e-therapy's been around for ages, um, really effective, great way to, to um, get services to people. Um, remote, and remote doesn't mean rural. Remote can be isolated within Wellington City. Uh, so yeah, I think huge. I mean, you think about the approach of a digital avatar, right, to someone who is experiencing anxiety, depression, or something that they feel a little bit uncomfortable with sharing. It might be a really early touch point that allows them to then pathway into the right services. Uh, so I think there's huge potential in using the different technologies. I mean, like wearables. Um, are you getting enough sleep? Well, we can tell that. Are you getting us activity, enough activity? How can we have 
notifications and reminders that, hey, look, you, this will be beneficial to your mental health if you're doing 30 minutes of this type of activity and exercise. So I think mental health is no different to some of the other health problems that will benefit from you know, new approaches and technologies, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for being disruptive, as usual. Um, I get democratising health. How are you going to democratise access to the tools to yeah. access what okay. you're talking about? So you're talking about the te technology devices? OK, cool. It's a good question, because, look, I, I was under this illusion too, you know, a number of years ago that hey, the most, uh, the, those that need the services most, and the smartest, you know, smart delivery of services is our aspiration, uh, may not have the means to access devices and then the connectivity, right? Well, that's a myth, okay? It's a myth because if you look at, look at social media, look at Facebook, you know, uh, if you want to get hold, if I want to get hold of someone in Kaitai in the Hokianga, places that had no phones, very limited Wi-Fi, the best way to get hold of them is message them, private message them. You know, you don't rely on a phone anymore. Example was I was seeing a patient in the Kaitai Hospital, a 65-year-old man, a komatua, had a two-year-old child with hooping, uh, croup. And, uh, and the child was fine. I said, look, go home, we'll contact you tomorrow, see how this child is. Now, the next day, I text him, I phoned him, he didn't answer the call. So I went around to this child's, uh, this uh, komatua's home in, in Kaitai, and I walk in, and I see the child's looking good, so I'm happy there. But I said, look, why didn't you respond to my text or answer my call? So answering my call is an easy one. They don't know my number, so you won't answer it. Uh, I had no credit. Okay, okay, so you, okay, so how do you get hold of people? He said Facebook. So he's got a phone that has Facebook capability, which can cost you $50 these days, right? Um, so what about how do you keep, keep, keep connected? And he, pay, he said, I pay my neighbour $5 a week and I get access to his Wi-Fi <laughs> on this half of the house. I was like, man, this, this is where the answers are. The answers aren't in this room. The answers are out in the community. And you know, you go to the go to the Kai Tai, Main Street of Kai Tai on a Sunday afternoon. There's a whole lot of kids outside the BNZ Bank. They're not they're not scoping the joint to rob it. They're using their Wi-Fi. So if I was a CEO of a D, <laughs> if I was a CEO of a DHB, I would pay for community Wi-Fi for my patients who are high users of my service, dialysis patients. Da 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 children with recurrent admissions in a hospital, da, da, you know, all these things. Anyone with chronic disease, because the return is the, if they're connected, they have access to services quicker, they will pre we'll prevent them decompensating and ending up in hospital. So I guess the, the response to that is, you, there's a myth out there that the most vulnerable communities don't have access to technology. And if Peter Beck gets his way, every part of New Zealand and the world will have um, internet access, because he's going to put micro satellites up around thousands of them in space. So I just think we shouldn't think of where we are today, but where we're going to be. If you, uh, uh, if you, you know, innovation is about where we want to be, not where we are or where we've come from. This same guy I went and had lunch with the other day said, you don't read enough books. And I don't. And I said, what? I know this sounds real bad, but got through medical school, I don't know how. Um, what have I got to learn from the past? You know, I'm a futurist, Bob. <laughs> And he, thought, he said, you're just a bullshit Lance. <laughs> and uh, look, if you're looking at designing the future health system, I, to be honest, the only things that I'm going to learn from the past is the immediate past of what's going wrong and how do I fix it. I should read more, my mum sees, but anyway. Oh, yeah, cool. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, you probably do, yeah. Okay, um, my question is around, you explained that um, people can call into a health centre and then there's contact with the doctor, um, and you were also uh, alluding to the avoidable hospital admissions, which those of us, particularly in Māori health, get put in our ears on a daily basis that we have to do something to prevent it. Um, what is the process then for admittance to hospitals, please, within this program that oh, you're advocating? So we don't want to be a regular referral of children to hospital, and that's, you know, the school-based service is quite good because they're actually triaged. 
young people, right? They've been seen by the parents in the morning, they're fairly well to go off to school. So it's a very good place to start with the whole very disruptive idea of virtual care, uh, which is already raising the, the uh, concern of the establishment. Um, so we don't send a lot of children directly to hospital, but we can if we need to, like this case. So yes, this is what I'm referring to. Yeah. So you, what then is that process, please? Oh, it's just a referral. I mean, from the a GP store. No, from us. So oh, the doctors okay. get a, ref an, a referral which has got video, photos, da, 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 and they go, "This is the best referral I've ever seen." And I, I would argue, because I've worked in the hospital which has been on the receiving end of the same, this, this case, and I would argue I wouldn't have even had to get out of my bed if I was the receiving doctor. If I had all that information, I'd say I want an X-ray and blood test and this and this. If the child's not decompensating, tachycardic, hypotensive and febrile, um, and the X-ray looks OK and the blood tests look OK, I'm going to stay at home. And then the next question is, why is there even a doctor there? Why don't we have enhanced nursing or other uh, ancillary health workers that could then start doing this because this is just all AI of the future, I think. And one of the scariest things that someone hasn't asked yet is, you know, how, what happens with the human element? Well, I'm just saying the human element is no longer the doctor or the nurse, it's the centre manager. You know, that's not going, that's still important, but we're just shifting, repurposing some roles. Oh, you've had one, Paula. Uh, I'm start. Um, I'm interested, um, virtual health care, there are some examples in New Zealand mm, where it's yes, failed yeah. abysmally. Yes. And I think in particular of Waikato, where I've had far now involved yes. in uh, a virtual health care project, which they turned away from and didn't want to have anything to do with. I'm yes. interested in your reflection on where it hasn't worked. Yeah. So, so I had quite a bit to do with uh, the smart health and the health tap. Um, so there's another one out of the UK called Babylon. Uh, so what it does prove is that this is not going to change. Okay, this is, this is happening. This, this move towards more uh, smarter health services globally just um, take exploding. I, I, I'm disappointed with what happened in Waikato. We, we, we had an opportunity to be involved there. We chose not to. But um, I'm disappointed because the intention was right. The execution was poor. So, you know, the technology behind smarter health was very, the cost was huge, the technology platform was average, but the intention was right, you know, and I sort of, you know, they shouldn't be, um, that shouldn't be forgotten, they were, although we were wrong in one thing, because they, when they launched two or three years ago, they said they're the first digital health service in New Zealand, I said, no, I've been around for two years before you guys, but the, um, yeah, look, it, it's, yeah, so that's, uh, I think there's learnings from that, you know, so just so everyone knows, the technology is only an enabler. It's not the answer. It's about, so my, my skill is about getting a, a basic technology and then putting it into a form and a shape that works well in the communities I'm interested in working in. You can't just say, here's a mothership technology, boom, it's gonna work, because it just won't. And that was the only, the only failing they had, was they didn't, they didn't, they didn't take that on board. And it's a shame because it did, it has created some distrust, if you like, but it shouldn't. I mean, it shouldn't because, you know, we need to go and push on forward. Um, Kia ora, Kia ora. Um, I'm, just, I'm just asking a one off question. Can you Yes. Yeah. So like if I talk more broadly about sort of how digital health services, uh, not just our own, uh, operate, it's all about individualised and personal care. And so like we just use children in schools as a really good demonstration site because it's quite a controlled environment for us to manage, especially when you're doing something so new. But in, within 24 months in New Zealand, there'll be, you know, people, not just me, there'll be other 
vendors like the Swift Med in, in Christchurch that will allow people to have access through their devices to health services. The, the key uh, barrier to that is the Ministry of Health, <laughs> is government and regulations and re legislation, right? The, that is the biggest barrier to the innovation that uh, is required to be able to see that occur. But so the answer is uh, for us, imminently, absolute yes. Like within three months, we will, we're partnering with a health insurer and a large iwi to deliver virtual health to those members through the devices at home. Yep. Oh, kia ora Lance. Um, I have in my hand a prototype of a Modi monitor. Have you heard of it? No. That's because I made it up. <laughs> <laughs> But a, a, Modi, a Modi monitor. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully one day you might have one of those tools yeah. for us. And on behalf of the NGO, I'd like to thank you. And um, what I like about Lance is he's homegrown. We haven't imported him from England or China or Hong Kong. He's here and he's making it. So, ngā mihi. Kia ora. Kia ora. Kia ora. <laughs> <laughs>